Hello, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the virtual conference live talks with Dov Benyakov Kurtzman, uh, the Corona Talks live, uh, Corona Views live talks. So this is open to anybody that uh, has access to my profile page on Facebook live. So if you know somebody's trying to get in and can't, then now is the time while we're waiting on Tom to um, get into my Facebook um, and I will answer any requests if you um, get them now. So I'm waiting on any requests. If you want to join me on Facebook, then request my friendship now and then we'll get, we'll get going. It looks like Tom is arriving. So Tom, can you hear me? Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Sorry. Hi. Oh, wonderful. How are you doing, Tom? Hi, Dove. How are you? Well, first of all, I'm a lot better now that I can see you and that you're here with me. Um, and um, interesting times we live in. Frightening. Frightening times we live in. They are indeed. And uh, you were the first person I thought of um when i thought about doing this and getting some experts some people that i know that know what they're talking about um to maybe help out i've been doing um a lot of uh, workshops in the last week and a half almost two or three times a day um just to keep you know people informed of what possibilities there are and then it came to me i thought why don't i get some people who really know what they're talking about and um well, we met last summer in Israel, and I had a wonderful time with you. And uh, I thought, well, I'll turn to Tom, and I've actually turned to quite a few people, and I've had a great, a great lineup coming. But um, we had such a great time last year. And who would have thought when we met last year in the summer that we would be in this kind of scary, weird, surreal situation that we find ourselves now? Well, who would have thought three weeks ago that we would be in this scary, strange situation that we're in right now? Absolutely. Uh oh, Dove, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Sometimes you're just cutting out a little bit, um, but we'll just have to deal with that because I think there's a lot of overload, you know, on bandwidth. Um, so we'll just have to try our best at this. Uh, Dove, would it help if I phone in and then you get my video here, but you get my audio through a uh, telephone? Um, I don't know if that would be good because it's actually being transferred to Facebook. So we'll just do see how we get on. Okay. All right. Now, once we actually officially start, because um, I'm just waiting on people joining us, we've got people joining us from Israel, from uh, people joining us from the UK. I'm actually in the UK at the moment, as you know. And um, there's a little delay, so I'm just waiting on people getting on. And then when we start, we're going to have 19 minutes, exactly. And um, the reason for that is that the program I use to transcribe everything has a 20-minute max. And in any case, I think 20 minutes is going to be enough for us to, to really um, have something of value from you. Um, and it's not just about us chatting and it's not about me for sure. So, you know, it'll be about you, but I'd also like, you know, to give something of value over to the people that are spending time at home in isolation and maybe just needing some of your experience. But I'd like you also to quickly introduce yourself and also talk about Sierra Leone and that kind of experience that you have with kind of crisis situations. I think that's important. Um, so in about one minute, um, we'll start officially and then the clock will tick. Um, and so I'd like you uh, to start off just basically introducing yourself. I think that's the best way rather than I do it. Just tell us who you are and a little bit about your experience. And then the time is yours to try and give over to us all um, of your uh, experience and knowledge. Does that sound okay with you, Tom? Yeah, sounds fine. Right. So I'm going to just wait. So it's, it's 
five past seven my time. Um, and basically we'll take that up to uh, half past seven with a couple of extra minutes um, if we need them. Oh, no, no, we don't have that long time. We have nine, I'm gonna get the time right here, otherwise I'll, I'll be in trouble. So, um, so 24, all right. So good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Virtual Conference Live Talks with Dov Ben Yakov Kurtzman. I've called this Corona Views Live Talks. Um, and I'd like to introduce you to a good friend and a colleague of mine, and basically a mentor of mine as well, um, Tom Zubo. And I'm gonna let him introduce himself because I could probably not do him as much justice as he can. So over to you, Tom. I'm looking forward to a great um, evening with you. Well, Ravi Dov, you are as much a mentor to me as you say I am to you. So it's a reciprocal relationship for sure. I'm a professor at Florida Institute of Technology and a graduate of the University of Nevada, Reno, where I did my doctoral studies with Steve Hayes and Larry Williams. And I am a board certified behavior analyst at the doctoral level. I, uh, that makes me uh, by, by trade, a behavioral psychologist, not a clinical psychologist. I don't do psychotherapy. I do applied behavior analysis. I'm also the second chair of Commit and Act International, which is a organization who's dedicated to treating trauma that women and children and couples have experienced in the Sierra Leonean context since the Civil War, through the Ebola crisis, and since the Ebola crisis. And I am a peer-reviewed acceptance and commitment therapy trainer. That is, I train therapists, psychologists, psychiatrists, and behavior analysts in the ACT model of psychological change which is also the strategy that we make use of in Commit and Act International. So that is, first of all, very impressive. And I knew that when I invited you that um, it was the right thing to start this off because you mentioned there, just in your introduction, your experience with the Ebola crisis, which at the time was also a very frightening time but it was contained in geographically, I suppose. Um, and here we're going, we're, we're, we're in a situation where it's basically everywhere, this whole idea of this biological agent. I mean, we're, some of us didn't even realize what viruses really were up until now. And now it's really affecting every single person. And today we found out in the United Kingdom that the heir to the throne, Prince Charles, has just been diagnosed with it as well. So it's everybody is uh, susceptible to these viruses. And so it's very, very frightening. Um, and what, what, from your experience, what can you offer us all basically in trying to get through these days, which we don't really know when the end is, um, to get through this? Yeah. So first of all, I, I, I want to point out that behavior analysts study the way everyone learns. And we learn during our lifetimes when certain things are related to the availability of rewards. We call these things that are related to the availability of rewards certain signposts. They are discriminative for the availability of reinforcement. If I do this thing, good things will happen to me. I know to do this good thing because there's a signpost telling me to do it. When there's a green light in most countries, driving a car and seeing that green light tells you, oh, it's okay for me to go forward. I'm not gonna get hurt if I go forward. And in most countries, a red light at an intersection means better slow the car down. Bad things are gonna happen to me. 
if I move forward. Here's our problem today. For the last month and a half, we haven't had green lights and red lights that were consistent telling us what to do. We heard about what was happening in Wuhan, China. Nobody knew why they should care. The president of the United States was telling United States citizens, don't worry, we got this under control. The International Olympics Committee was telling athletes all over the world until just this week, no problem. If you're under quarantine, exercise at home. We got this. Meanwhile, public health experts, virologists and epidemiologists around the world were saying, whoa, wait a minute, you don't got this. This is serious, you need to take this seriously. Nani Presti is a dear friend of mine, past president of the Association for Contextual Behavior Science, lives in Northern Italy and was saying, whoa, you people need to prepare. The UK and the United States need to recognize you're next. Wow. Like we're the travel agents right here and we're signing up all these microbes on our air travel to go visit you. They're coming to get you. They're on their way, take it seriously. But you see, when you got one group of experts saying, take this seriously, and another group of experts saying, you don't have to take this seriously, we got this, those messages cancel out. We don't have a green light, we don't have a red light. We got no lights. That's what makes this situation so traumatizing for all of us, for you and for me, because we don't know what we need to do to keep ourselves and our loved ones safe. People so keep sorry. asking me, what did you learn from Ebola right. in Sierra Leone that we can make use of here? There's two things that I want to point out. The situation in developing nations, which were ground zero, Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone for the Ebola crisis, is very, very different than the situation that we're experiencing here with coronavirus. In the developing nations, there was no infrastructure whatsoever for containment. The hospitals were perfect breeding grounds. People went into the hospital and they were housed two people to a bed. If hospital workers had any personal protective equipment whatsoever, they simply washed it at night and then put the same personal protective equipment, I'm talking about masks, on the next day. And they didn't have respirators, which were the advanced form of 95% particulate that gets contained by a respirator mask or 99% or 100% on the most advanced models. They didn't have any of those. They just had surgical masks and they didn't have gloves all the time. And more importantly, they didn't have enough needles. So if they vaccinated one person, they simply washed the needle and then used the same needle again. The situation there was very, very different. In addition, they had native practices to that area for funeral rites, which included rubbing down the bodies of their deceased loved ones with oil, hugging and kissing them, and putting all of their favorite items next to them to bid them off to their journeys after death. And these practices were the most important practices for spreading the virus. Wow. We were concerned in the West that what happened there would spread but we had a very, very different medical system that kept that virus from penetrating in our countries. There is, however, one point of intersect that I think we need to be very, very cautious about. Not only, let me backtrack a second. It's important to note that the spread of this virus that we're dealing with right now, COVID-19, is way more pernicious, way more serious than that of Ebola. Ebola is on its way to Africa too. It just hasn't gotten there yet. 
It's taking its time. It's traveling. Can I, can I show you a graphic that's really important for understanding what we're dealing with? Yeah, absolutely. You can show. Uh, what I would like you to do so that we don't run out of time also is for everyone sitting at home, right? They're watching you now. They're sitting at home. What, what can we do just even to get through the next few minutes, the next few hours, the next few days that you could advise us or maybe even show us now that we could, you know, using your act knowledge, your behavioral analysis knowledge, what can we do physically to help each other or to help ourselves to deal with the fear? Yeah, I, I'm totally gonna get there. You can remind me of where we're at with time. But I wanted to show you this graphic because I think it's important. Okay. This graphic is a semi-logarithmic graph, which shows the exponential development of deaths by, by countries. And it, the New York Times just published this yesterday, so it's very current. What you see here is that leveling of the curve is happening in a couple of countries, Japan, South Korea, mainland China. The graph starts at 25 deaths. All nations who are being tracked with under 25 deaths aren't on this. This only shows countries with more than 25 deaths. On the right, the day before the New York Times published nations that are on lockdown, half of the countries that are shown in the graphic on the left are on lockdown. In other words, lockdown may be necessary, but it's not sufficient. It's not gonna flatten the curve by itself. Aggressive testing is being done only by four nations, China, Australia, Singapore, and South Korea. Aggressive testing has demonstrated effective results at containing this virus. Those four countries, two of them aren't even on this graphic because they haven't had 25 deaths. The other two have flattened the curve, South Korea and mainland China. I think this is important. We need, you and I need to set up programs for contacting our elected officials and uh, demanding aggressive testing. That is the one thing that has led to isolating the people who needed to be isolated and containing the spread of this virus. So I wanted to share that because I think that what we do at the intrapersonal level has to be matched by what we do at the intrapersonal level. We need to contact our elected officials and mobilize our resources together simultaneously while we do work intrapersonally. Right, so I think, I think that is extraordinary what you said because the, what it means basically is most of us probably watching this and that you might have some from Australia. In fact, if you could put, if you're watching this, put in in the comments where you're watching from, it would be very interesting just to, to see that. So that would be great. Just put in the comments, if you're watching this, where you're coming in from. Um, but basically what you're saying is, if we're not doing this, um, you know, massive aggressive testing, uh, Looks like we're going to be carrying on the way we are for quite a long time then. Precisely. I think that there's, there's no hope left for a two-week self-containment effort. Social distancing is important, but it's not the only thing that's going to be required. You mentioned ACT. I think it's going to be really important for us all to recognize that if we're going to be at home by ourselves for a sustained period of time. We have to begin to look at where we become our own worst enemies. 
what are the ways that we damage our own psychological well-being? What are the ways we begin to make our discomfort unnecessarily painful? What are the ways that we create suffering where we don't need to? Oh, so what, uh, that, that sounds like, like you're leading into something that might, I mean, what, what worries me on one hand is just what you've showed us. So hopefully I just he- read tonight, you know, you never know, there's so much fake kind of news going around. You're not quite sure what's right, what's not. That's also a confusion that's adding to our suffering. But I read um, tonight that the UK might be distributing, mass distributing um, home testing kits. Um, So if that is the case, that's something that what you're saying is that what we should be doing, we should be testing to see if we have the virus or not, basically. Is that what you're saying? Yes. And... uh figuring out ways to isolate people who are suspected of having the virus while they're waiting for test results and figuring out ways to isolate people who are known to have the virus. Right. For sure. So getting back to what you were just saying there about our suffering and what we're adding to our suffering, which might not be necessary. And maybe we can help do something about that because obviously when we're living in a, in a threatening situation and I personally have been uh, in situations where I've been through war situations and battle situations. Um, there is one point where at the beginning where you get quite frightened and sometimes even paralyzed from fear, but as it goes on, Humans are very adaptable, I've found, and you begin to kind of get used to lots of different things. Um, But as you said, it's that extra suffering that we don't really need, um, and it causes us that extra pain that sometimes we don't know how to deal with that. Is there something that you could enlighten us with from your experience and knowledge? Yeah. Yeah, what if, uh, what if, all the anxiety that you experience around getting or having or giving the virus to other people and all the fear that you have about whether you're doing the right thing or not aren't the enemy. What if the fact that you're experiencing anxiety and fear means you're alive and you're healthy? These Emotions that we experience, they're important. We need those experiences. We need those emotions. They help us keep vigilant and stay strong. They help us look for what's in the way. But when these emotions start calling the shots, then they in turn make us suffer more than we need to. It's like, who's driving your bus? Is it you or is it your anxiety and your fear? If anxiety and fear are driving your bus, you don't get to say where you're going. If you're driving and you simply allow your anxiety and your fear to be there on the bus with you, sitting on your lap, holding them in your arms, then you're the one who's driving that bus. You get to say where you're going. I think that's the most healthy way to manage the inevitable and important and useful fear and anxiety that you're experiencing. They're not the enemy. Letting them drive the bus is the problem. Well, I think that's amazing what you've just said. And, and I think with, a, well, look, I know for myself, I can't talk for anybody else, but I know for myself there are times when, yeah, my emotions are driving my bus, you know? Mm-hmm. And what would you say? And, and, and I've kind of, this is too important for me to, to um, stick with the 19 minutes, by the way. So I've let it go because it's really important. 
So what can we do um, practically, experientially, to get ourselves back in that driving seat? And I think if we can finish off with that, but what practically can we do? Yeah. Well, I would say that one of the most important things is to be able to do very quick little scans of where your emotions are in your body throughout the day. Just take 30 seconds out at a time to just kind of notice where am I feeling it right now? Is it in my head? Is it in my eyeballs? Is it in my shoulders? Is it in my chest? Without trying to get rid of it, just noticing where it is helps to minimize the space that it takes up. If you can think of like this glass of water, it's filled with water. But if I were to pour in some blue dye, the water would still be at the level that it is. The blue dye would begin to take up space. If I pour in more water, the blue dye would have less of a concentrated solution. And that's what we do when we do these kinds of scans of our body. We just allow what is in there to be there without taking up all the space in that medium. We're not gonna get rid of it anytime soon, the anxiety and the fear that you're experiencing but it can be less important in the end than everything else. The water that you drink, the air that you breathe, the food that you eat, the love that you share with people who you care about. That's beautiful. So basically opening up, making space for what we're experiencing inside, doing that body scan, as you said, going there from top to bottom, just kind of observing, identifying what we see showing up and just making space for it. And, and you mentioned also something else I think is important at that same time or more or less at the same time, looking at the things that are important, that mean things to us, the water, the air, the gratitude that we've got for what we do have. I think that's a beautiful formula that you've just put out there for us. You know, I got one last thing, which is really important along those lines. Yeah. When you really care about your children and those children go to school during the day and then they go to soccer practice or football practice and then they come home and you're with them for two hours, it's easy to see how much you cherish those kids. But when those kids are with you all day and all night long, day in and day out for an unforeseeable future, during which time you cannot share the burden with anyone else. You cannot say, hey, sister of mine, would you do me a favor and take the kids for a couple of hours? I wanna to go to a yoga class. There is no yoga class. You're doing that at home and so are the kids. Those kids that you love and cherish, it's really easy for them to get on your nerves. And it's really easy for you to get on their nerves. And it's really easy for a cycle of coercion to begin to build up during which you try and put them in their place and they try and put you in your place. And we start to escalate into a pattern of coercive interactions that ultimately leads to violence. Childhood aversive experiences, ACEs, are a serious issue that we need to prepare for in our efforts to manage the coronavirus affair that we're dealing with. Sierra Leone experienced an uptick in aversive childhood experiences during the Ebola crisis. And guess what? Even though the Ebola virus has been contained for the last three years, the prevalence of aversive childhood experiences has not. It's like once it became acceptable to beat your children during the Ebola crisis, because everybody was contained inside of their homes with their kids for 24 hours a day, 
it became acceptable and it didn't stop being acceptable after the kid, after the virus, after the epidemic was over. We can expect in the Western nations and in the Eastern nations that when people are at home for 24 hours a day with their kids, kids are gonna be difficult for them. And the probability of aversive childhood experiences is gonna increase. We need to figure out ways to help parents recognize the stress that they're feeling is just the stress that they're feeling. And we need to, as a culture, prepare for the increase in the probability of aversive childhood experiences. We need to help parents figure out ways to manage their stress, kids to deal with the stress of living at home, and we need to, as a society, prepare for the probability of increased aversive childhood experiences to come. Well, I think you've absolutely hit the bullseye there because my experience is, in, in the last week and a half, when it, is that great parents are beginning to experience exactly what you're experiencing now. This having the kids all the time, which is amazing, right? But people, kids and parents naturally get on each other's nerves, just like just like you said, when it's when it, when we're basically living in individual submarines and there's nowhere to go, um, and I think being aware of this first of all, you've brought that awareness to the surface that this is a normal react. This is something that's going to happen, and I think that's really important that you've hit on that, so that all the parents listening to this, whether on the live or on the on the repeat, um, when they come in and watch it later on the recording, that they get that feeling, okay, first of all, this is expected. Um, and to prepare for that, to prepare that it might happen. I, I think the only thing that I can offer is that, you know, 11 o'clock in the morning, UK time, every single day, I have a um, act mindful workout for half an hour, 45 minutes every day. And I really, really recommend that the parents, mothers and fathers, even bring your um, children along and, and we do it together. And we have this sense of community, sense of support. And we're doing these body scans that you talked about and dealing with those thoughts and feelings as well. And so that's what I can offer. And you've offered such a lot for us tonight. And I really, really appreciate it, Tom. You don't know how much I do really appreciate it. I'm quite actually emotional about the fact that you've come on and dedicated this time. I know you're very, very busy. You're a professor. And I don't take that lightly. Um, thank you very much, Tom, for everything that you've given us and given our people that are watching and tuning in to this on Facebook Live. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Back at you, everybody. All right, Dove. Take care. Be well. Bye. Stay healthy. Bye for now.